Hi everybody, this is Rob Swatsky from the York Campus of Hack, and in this podcast we will review the overall anatomy of the heart. Cardiology is the study of the normal structure and function of the heart, along with its associated diseases. The prefix cardio refers to anything having to do with the heart. The heart is a relatively small organ, about the size of an apple or your fist. It's about five inches long, three and a half inches wide, and two and a half inches thick, and weighs about eight to ten ounces. The heart sits on the diaphragm, the large dome-shaped muscle separating the thoracic and abdominal cavities. It is positioned close to the midline of the thoracic cavity, with about two-thirds of its mass to the left of the midline. It is found in the mediastinum, a region of the thoracic cavity located in between the lungs and bordered by the sternum or breastbone on the anterior side and the vertebrae on the posterior side. Think of the general position of the heart as a cone tilted on its side. The upper end of the heart is referred to as the base because it has a flat appearance and is more posterior in its orientation. The base includes the two upper chambers of the heart called the atria. Here's the right atrium and the left atrium, and in particular the base includes most of the left atrium. The apex of the heart is the inferior pointed region that includes the tip of the left ventricle one of the two lower chambers of the heart. Here we see on the anterior view of the heart the two ventricles. Here's the right ventricle and the left ventricle. The apex is positioned more anteriorly, is angled towards the left, and sits on the diaphragm. The surfaces of the heart include the anterior surface, which is directly under or deep to the sternum and ribcage. The inferior surface, which is the area that sits on the diaphragm between the apex and the right surface or right border, located next to the right lung, and the left surface or left border, which is next to the left lung. Surrounding and protecting the heart is a membrane called the pericardium. It maintains the position of the heart in the mediastinum, but gives the heart enough room for its contraction and movement. There are two main components of the pericardium, the superficial fibrous pericardium and the deeper serous pericardium. The fibrous pericardium is a strong bag-like outer layer made of dense irregular connective tissue that is attached to the diaphragm. Because it is so tough and inelastic, it functions in physical protection of the heart, maintains the heart's position in the mediastinum, and keeps the heart from overstretching. The thin serous pericardium forms a double layer membrane around the heart. The outermost layer of the serous pericardium is called the parietal layer and is attached to the fibrous pericardium. The innermost membrane is called the visceral layer, also known as the epicardium, and also forms part of the heart wall, strongly attached to the heart surface. Here we see in this cross-sectional view of the heart wall from the external outermost region to the internal regions of the heart wall. Here's the pericardium forming the outermost protective covering and just deep to that is the parietal layer of the serous pericardium. We have a space called the pericardial cavity and then just on the opposite side of that making contact with the heart itself is the visceral layer of the serous pericardium, also called the epicardium. There is a small amount of lubricating serous fluid called pericardial fluid located in 
the pericardial cavity between the parietal and visceral layers. This fluid functions as a liquid cushion that minimizes friction between the parietal and visceral layers as the heart contracts. There are three layers that make up the heart wall itself. The outermost layer is called the epicardium, the middle layer is the myocardium, and the innermost layer is the endocardium. The epicardium is the smooth, slippery outer covering that surrounds the heart. There are two layers of tissue that make up the epicardium. The visceral layer of the serous pericardium is the outermost layer and underneath that is a layer of connective tissue consisting of adipose tissue, fibroelastic tissue, as well as blood vessels. The visceral layer consists of a thin transparent layer of mesothelium which is simple squamous epithelium. There are varying amounts of adipose tissue underneath usually more in older adults, with most of it located around the right and left ventricles where it surrounds the heart's coronary blood vessels. The myocardium is the middle layer, think M is in the middle, that consists of cardiac muscle tissue. This is the layer of the heart wall that is acting as the pump, contracting the heart, helping to pump blood about 95% of the heart wall consists of myocardium. The cardiac muscle fibers are organized in bundles and surrounded with connective tissue coverings similar to skeletal muscle tissue. These bundles are also arranged in superficial and deep layers that diagonally swirl around the heart, helping to pump blood in a specific one-way direction. The endocardium is the thin inner layer of the heart wall that consists of a smooth layer of endothelium on top of a layer of connective tissue. It lines the heart's four chambers and covers the valves, helping to minimize friction as blood flows through the heart. The heart contains four chambers, two superior chambers called atria, the left atrium, and the right atrium that receive blood returning to the heart from veins, and two inferior chambers called ventricles, the left ventricle and the right ventricle that pump blood out of the hearts into arteries. On the anterior surface of each atrium is an ear-like pouch called an auricle. The left and right auricles help increase the volume of blood that each atrium can hold. There are also grooves called sulci, singular is sulcus, located on the heart's surface that contain adipose tissue surrounding the heart's coronary blood vessels. The sulci also act as superficial external division lines between the heart's chambers. The coronary sulcus is a deep groove that divides the superior atria and inferior ventricles on both the anterior and posterior sides of the heart. The anterior interventricular sulcus is a shallow groove that divides the right and left ventricles on the anterior side of the heart. The posterior interventricular sulcus is a continuation of the anterior interventricular sulcus that divides the right and left ventricles on the posterior side of the heart. The right atrium is a thin wall chamber found on the right side of the heart and is the receiving point for blood draining into it from three veins the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. Here's the superior vena cava, or SVC. Here's the inferior vena cava, or IVC, draining into the right atrium. 
and here is the opening of the coronary sinus. Remember that veins always drain blood into the heart. And for color coding in the diagrams, blue represents oxygen poor or deoxygenated blood, while red indicates oxygenated or oxygen rich blood. The anterior wall of the right atrium and auricle has a rough appearance due to pectinate muscles, which are muscular bundles projecting up from the atrial wall. In between the right and left atria is a thin dividing wall called the interatrial septum. It's not shown too well on the diagram, but it would be right around this point here between the right atrium and the left atrium. Located on the septum is a small indentation called the fossa ovalis, which is what was left behind when an opening called the foramen ovale closes after birth. Deoxygenated or oxygen poor blood flows from the right atrium into the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve, also called the right atrioventricular valve or the right AV valve. It is called the tricuspid valve because it consists of three cusps or flaps of dense connective tissue covered by endocardium. You can remember the valve's name with the phrase, the rat is on the right, where the word rat is an acronym that represents the right atrioventricular valve or tricuspid. The right ventricle is a thicker wall chamber that accounts for most of the heart's anterior surface. The inside of the chamber contains cardiac muscle fibers that are arranged in ridge-like bundles called trabeculi carnii. We encounter the word trabeculi in our study of bones, and this term means little beams. The word carnii means fleshy, like a carnivore eating only meat, and describes the cardiac muscles that make up these fleshy beams. The trabeculi carnii function in muscle contraction, but also help carry the cardiac muscle action potential through the heart's conduction system to allow regular synchronized contraction. The chordae tendini are tough, tendon-like cords of connective tissue that are attached to the cusps of the tricuspid valve. The chordae are also connected to papillary muscles, which are cone-shaped trabeculi carnii that project from the ventricular wall. In between the right and left ventricles is a partition called the interventricular septum. As blood flows out of the right ventricle, it goes through the pulmonary valve, also called the pulmonary semilunar valve, and makes its way into the pulmonary trunk, a large artery that branches into the right and left pulmonary arteries. These pulmonary arteries are carrying deoxygenated blood to the lungs. Remember that arteries carry blood away from the heart. The left atrium on the heart's superior left side forms most of the region we call the base of the heart. There are four pulmonary veins, shown here in the diagram in red, that are carrying oxygenated or oxygen-rich blood from the lungs into the left atrium. Blood flows from the left atrium into the left ventricle through the bicuspid valve, also called the left atrioventricular valve, the left AV valve, or the mitral valve, because it looks sort of like the two-sided hat a bishop wears that is called a mitre. It is called the bicuspid because it consists of two cusps or flaps. You can remember this valve with the phrase, the lamb is on the left, 
where the word LAM is an acronym meaning the left atrioventricular or mitral valve or bicuspid valve. The last of the four chambers is the left ventricle which makes up the apex of the heart and is the thickest walls of the heart's chambers. It contains the trabeculae carnii, like the right ventricle, and also has chordae tendini, attached to the cusps of the bicuspid valve, and papillary muscles. When the oxygenated blood is ejected out of the left ventricle, it flows through the aortic valve, also called the aortic semilunar valve. From the aortic semilunar valve, the blood is flowing then into the ascending aorta. Some of this blood is then directed into the coronary arteries, both right and left, that supply the heart wall, while the rest of the blood flows on through the arch of the aorta and continues into the descending aorta where it is then delivered to the rest of the body. So from the left ventricle through the aortic semilunar valve into our ascending aorta, the left and right coronary arteries aren't shown on this diagram but they would be around here and here. From the ascending aorta through the arch of the aorta and then down the descending aorta. During fetal development, there is a blood vessel called the ductus arteriosus, which temporarily brings blood into the aorta from the pulmonary trunk. This limits the amount of blood that enters the fetal lungs, which are not yet developed and do not function. After birth, the ductus arteriosus closes up and remains as the ligamentum arteriosum, seen here in the diagram. This is a tough little bundle of connective tissue that connects the pulmonary trunk to the arch of the aorta. There is a correlation between the function of the heart's chambers and the thickness of their walls and the amount of myocardium in each. Both the right and left atria have thinner walls. Because they are pumping low-pressure blood collected from the veins and the lungs just one floor down into the ventricles. This blood doesn't have far to travel, so the atria don't have to contain that much muscle in order to do their job. The ventricles have thicker walls than the atria because they have to pump higher-pressure blood a farther distance to the lungs and to the other body systems respectively. However, the right ventricle doesn't have to pump blood as far as the left ventricle in that it is pumping lower pressure blood with less resistance to its two next door neighbors, the left lung and the right lung. So the right ventricle, as we can see in this cross section through the ventricles, has a thinner wall of around four to five millimeters thick in comparison to the much thicker wall of the left ventricle which is between 10 and 15 millimeters in thickness. The left ventricle is thicker because it's pumping higher pressure blood with higher resistance to the rest of the body. 